Hello, and thank you for joining this talk on Persistent Workers in Basel. My name is Lars. I'm a Googler in the Munich office. I'm Susan. I am a Googler in the New York office. And we want to tell you how to get the best performance out of Basel's persistent workers. First, we're going to give an introduction to the worker concept, what the problem they were made to solve and how do they solve it. Then we're going to go through how do you tune the workers for best performance. Then for rule maintainers, we're going to tell you how do you create a worker. And then we're going to go over some advanced topics and upcoming work. What's it all about? Performance. This slide shows the time it takes to do a clean build of Basel itself on a six core Linux machine. On the left, the regular um, non worker builds, and on the right, with, with workers. And as you can see, with workers, your build is about three times as fast. And you can also see that sandboxing isn't actually very expensive. And this is a clean build for incremental builds. You can get even better performance. You can get up to six times speed up. We've seen in some of our incremental benchmarks. So let's take a look at what's behind the speed up. The basic problem is that Basil runs many actions. Um, every single step of a build is a separate action. And without workers, each action would run at a separate process in the operating system, which means you can't do any kind of internal cache of, for instance, ASTs. But more critically, especially for JVM-based tools, you are not able to um, benefit any from your just-in-time, and you're going to have your startup costs over and over again. This includes creating a JVM, reading in classes, initializing, etc. All that takes time that's wasted. So workers solve this problem by running process for a long time, and each process can handle multiple pieces of work. Basil, the server, manages the lifetime of the workers, the creation and the shutdown, and communicate over standard in and standard out with the workers but the workers write the artifacts directly to disk. This is often just a thin wrapper around an existing tool. For instance, for Java C, the wrapper calls into the Java compilation API. And these workers are on by default for any mnemonic that implements them uh, because the worker strategy is uh, the default before local. This is useful for any kind of runtime, but particularly the JVM benefits a lot from it. So we're going to be focusing uh, on some of the things that affect the JVM. So here's a little schematic view of what happens during a build. You do your build from the command line. It talks with RPC to the Basel server, and that then talks to the various workers. In this case, there are two workers for Java C and one for Go, and they just sit around and do their work. Now, you may say having two separate workers for Java C is again a waste, and that is correct. Uh, we should be using threads or Go routines or whatever our system has. And recently, an external contribution added that. We are very grateful for this community contribution. Basically, this is an extension to the worker protocol that allows parallelized works in a single worker. This, when implemented, it's automatically used. You can turn it off if you run into problems with the dash dash no worker multiplex flag. So this allows having a single cache for all your various builds. But more importantly, it saves the memory overhead, especially for having multiple JVMs. We have a few stability problems that we're currently looking into, but we are already at Google using this internally in some teams. There are a few flags that help you tune the behavior of workers to get better performance. 
And the most important one of those flags is worker max instances, which sets the number of workers. It can take a raw number to set the default, and it can also take mnemonic equals value to set the number of workers for a particular action type. The default is four, but you almost certainly want something less than that. And the reason for that is that we count the number of workers by worker key. And the worker key depends on a lot of different factors, uh, the arguments, the environment, the executable, and that the number of possible worker keys is potentially unbounded. So having a small multiplier can keep the resource usage under control. At Google, we turn workers off by default, and then teams configure the use of certain workers to meet their needs. That's something that you might want to do, or you might want to reduce the default number of workers to one and raise the number of certain mnemonics that you care about. Um, that'll be up to you, and the right number of workers varies a lot depending on what your build looks like and the amount of parallelism you have, what your machine is like. So once you've done the research to determine the right number of workers for which mnemonics for you, you can set those values with this flag, and they can also be set relative to machine resources. So you can give them a number, but you can also give them a multiplier of the host CPUs or the host RAM. As you can see from this graph, it's important to get the number of workers right. Um, workers can use more memory. More workers can use more memory. Uh, this is a build of Bazel, as you saw in the previous graph. And the reason there aren't any more red bars is that the machine ran out of memory and couldn't continue the build with more workers than that. Uh, also, the blue bars, which are the multiplex workers, you don't see that problem for. But if you do want to tune the number of multiplex workers, you can set them with experimental worker max multiplex instances, which is quite a mouthful. A few other flags that affect the behavior of workers are here. Uh, Lars will tell you a little bit more about what sandboxing is, but you can toggle the behavior of that with the worker sandboxing flag. High priority workers takes a list of mnemonics that are high priority, maybe because those actions are on the critical path. And Bazel will prioritize those actions while throttling act actions of other types. Worker extra flag allows you to pass an arbitrary list of flags to all of your workers. Quit after build is what you would expect. Um, and I'm about to tell you a little bit more about creating workers. This last flag pertains more to that part. Um, experimental worker allow JSON protocol uh, tells Bazel to allow workers to communicate with it using JSON instead of requiring them to communicate with Proto. So it doesn't mean that workers have to speak JSON, but it means that if a worker speaks JSON, Bazel will tolerate that. So how do you create a worker? What a worker is is actually very simple. It's a binary. It accepts the persistent worker flag. It reads work requests from standard in. It does some stuff, writing any artifacts that it creates directly to the file system. And then it writes a work response to standard out. Notably, it shouldn't do anything other than that on the standard in and standard out. It only reads work requests and writes work responses. Um, it can write errors to standard error, but it shouldn't write them to standard out. What is a work request? It's a structure. It has some arguments to the worker. That's a list. It also has a list of path digest pairs, uh, which represent the input files that the worker is allowed to access. They're not actually restrictive. They're usually just used for cache verification. Uh, the worker can has access to the files that it needs to use. Um, and it also contains a request ID, which is zero if the worker is not a multiplex worker. So the worker interprets the request, does what it needs to do, writes what it needs to write to the file system, and then it returns a work response. And a work response contains an exit code, just zero versus non-zero. It contains the same request ID from the work request, 
And then it also has this output field. So as you might remember, the worker shouldn't be writing anything to standard out other than this work response. So you, you might have any error messages created put into this output field so that Bazel can parse them. I'll talk a little bit more about where those go in a minute. But first, that's the worker part. There will also be a rule that uses that worker. So you've created this binary that follows those rules. You'll have a rule that defines that maybe Java binary. And then you'll also have a rule, this is an example in Starlark, that refers to that worker that you've created. You can imagine that there's another field maybe called worker that has a label that pertains to the worker binary that you created. And then it also needs these two other sections. So it also contains a list of arguments, which is a list of strings that get passed to the worker. And then also this at flag file argument. And that is the location of a file that Bazel creates that contains the additional arguments to that worker. And then it also contains execution requirements, which is a key value store that must contain supports workers equals one and may also contain requires worker protocol equals JSON or proto. So it'll default to proto if you don't list requires workers pro worker protocol. But if your worker does communicate using JSON, it needs to have this field and it also uh, needs to have that experimental uh, worker require uh, allow JSON protocol flag passed to the build. In terms of debugging workers, um, there are two main places where you can expect to find the logs. So one is in the Bazel Java logs, and the other is in the worker output file files. The Bazel log includes a few things. It'll contain Bazel's best guess about what happened, so whether there was no response or whether the response wasn't formatted correctly. It'll contain the output field of the work response that you saw earlier. And it'll also contain a path to the log file, which has the standard error of the worker process. And Bazel will print out all of these if the exit code isn't zero. So if there is an issue, but if you want to see the path to that log file in cases where there is a zero exit code, you can pass worker verbose to your build and Bazel will print out the location of that log file. And because the worker process is just like any other program, you can use whatever tools you'd use to debug another program um, to debug the worker process as well. And so I'll turn it over to Lars, who will tell you a bit about sandboxing and dynamic execution, some other topics. OK, so that was how you use workers and how you create workers. So let's get into some advanced topics. First of all, sandboxing. As I mentioned, this is a very important concept in Basel. We want to be able to have hermetic builds, and sandboxing is a main part of that. Now, all the tools involved in a build have always been cooperative in their sandboxing. Uh, they could write to files in other places, and then a second action could read that, but we don't want to do that because that would break the hermeticity. Um, when we have workers, it gets a little more complicated because now you have long processes that might leave something in memory, might use a uh, common temp file area or might put its cache in a certain place or it might just expect that once an action has been done the process would exit and so not do a proper cleanup the workers need to handle the cleanup properly now in multiplex workers it gets even worse uh, because they might have temp files that then the different threats could happen to find. And it has to be threat safe. So there's even more 
verification that needs to be done to make sure that a multiplex workers is actually properly hermetic. Unfortunately, so far, multiplex workers are implicitly not fully hermetic because they all write into the same directory. They only have one output directory per process, and now we have many workers threads writing into that directory. They are not sandboxed yet. We are working on how to fix that. Basically, we want the request to be able to specify where to put the results. There is also uh, a potential for output races, in particular when we use the new dynamic scheduling system. This is a system for remote execution frameworks, which are becoming more and more useful, where you speculative execute an action both locally and remotely, and whichever comes first wins. Since a remote execution framework can be great for massive caching and massive parallelism, this is fantastic when you want to do a clean build. It's not so great on latency for incremental builds, so there the local would be best. Now the output race is that if the remote execution finishes first, we'll have to prevent the workers from overwriting the result files because the workers are still running. And we have looked at various ways to add locks to prevent this race, but they cost performance. Um, what we need to have for this to work well is a way to cancel a worker and a way to sandbox it properly. Now, canceling is not something that the current worker, pro worker protocol allows doing. We want to be able to contact a specific worker or worker thread and say, stop working. This would make this whole lock problem much, much faster, much, much simpler. And it will allow for faster reuse of the worker itself. It can go right ahead and start on the next work request. It will also fix the slight annoyance that if you interrupt a build, the workers will actually finish their work, which could take a lot of time and CPU. Problem is, cancellation is something that we will need to add to the worker request, and the workers need to figure out how to actually support this correctly. These are the next things we're going to be working on. We want to improve the multiplex stability. We want to add sandboxing. We want to be able to cancel workers, but we also want to be able to cap resource usage by workers. Currently, Basil doesn't know how many resources, CPU and memory in particular, the workers are using. We need to feed that information back so that Basil can balance having the fastest build possible with a box that is still usable in the meantime. So these are all things we're going to be working on in the coming months. Thank you for listening in, and we hope this will help you build faster with Basil and make all your builds both fast and correct. Mm -hmm.